what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. View the show for industry creatives with a passion for photography, beauty, fashion, and style. And now, the host, Errol Dunlap. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the industry view. I'm Errol Dunlap. Thanks for joining me. For those of you who Listen to my preview episode. Thank you and subscribe. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to officially kick this podcast off. It's been on my mind for a while. Uh, I actually started, actually, I think this month, a decade ago, I tried to kick off podcasting in Chicago. Um, I don't think Chicago was, was ready for it. <laughs> I don't think many people even knew what it was. Still to this day, a lot of people don't know what podcasting is, but there's tons of people making a lot of good money, making a lot of great connections and meeting a lot of interesting people. And that's my goal with this podcast. I want to meet great people in the industry that I love and uh, hear their story. So my first episode, David Leslie Anthony, international fashion photographer and a good friend. I am very honored to have had the opportunity to work on his behalf. Um, so this episode, I met up with David in New Orleans and over my bourbon and his Coke, um, I asked him a bunch of questions. So without further ado, as people say, <laughs> here's that interview. Welcome, everybody. This is the Industry View with Errol Dunlap. I'm your host, and I'm here with David Leslie Anthony on the Industry View. And we are in New Orleans, in downtown New Orleans, in New Louisiana. Uh, it's a little noisy because we are having a drink at, what's the name of this hotel? The International House Hotel. The International House Hotel. Beautiful hotel. But uh, thank you again, David, for doing this podcast. I know it's a little different, a little weird, but I appreciate you and your time. How's uh, New Orleans treating you? Oh, you know, same shit, different day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice here. It's relaxing and so forth. It's... Um, um, they call it the Big Easy, and uh, people drive slow, slower than driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> yeah, we drove around a little bit, and it's definitely slow. Yes. <laughs> they take it real easy in the oh, Big that Easy. that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you drive fast. <laughs> Everyone else is, is slow as fuck, so. <laughs> yeah, and coming straight out of New York, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting everyone to be moving a little quicker but it doesn't happen <laughs> we're in the south so 72 degrees out we can't complain too much no and it's uh, what 8 o'clock at night right cannot complain drinking a hand <laughs> <laughs> yeah I have a Coca-Cola and it was a very good year for Coca-Cola <laughs> right he has a vintage Coke guys <laughs> very good year yeah <laughs> So, David, I, you know, I'm doing this podcast just about industry, you know, where where it's going, where it's been. And uh, talking with you, I think, is definitely a different perspective, you know, than what I would get from a lot of people. So, in your own words, uh, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I've been a photographer for, um, God, uh, 26, 27 years now. I began my career in... Uh, the fall of 1989, and um, uh, been through a tremendous amount of ups and downs. It's, this is a career that uh, you're going to experience ups and downs throughout the entire career, the whole entire lifetime of your career, and it's how you handle each one of those. Uh, but I, uh, I've been fortunate that uh, I shoot for. Uh, publishing houses like Condé Nast and Hearst, and uh, have worked with a number of very good and top clients. Um, and um, 
and so forth. I mean, you're always rediscovering yourself. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's ever evolving. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, each day you look at the world differently. Right. And so, therefore, it translates in how you photograph, how you see things. Yeah, I, I remember, and I've, I've worked on your team as an assistant, and I remember you telling me about perspective, about it being from what you've experienced. Absolutely. It's a photographer's style is, is not doing things one way or another way. It's, it's cultivated by all their experiences from the time that they were young to the age that they are now. All, all the things that they've seen, all the places that they've been, right. the people that have come into their life, right. all of that goes into shaping your viewpoint and how you see the world and how you translate that world into your photographs. Yeah, yeah. What would you say would be the earliest experience that you can think can, that you can think of that affected your photography like a musician I think pain yeah. in your life love in your life and eventually finding yourself in life affect your photography mm, mm. the I've always lived by a saying that that you can't change where you came from, but you can sure as hell change where you're going. Mm. And I didn't grow up in a nice, happy household um, without going into a lot of personal things. Um, it wasn't very pleasant. And so all of that its way in my photographs at some point yeah um, and all the wonderful people I've met in my life walking the streets at night and seeing how just a couple in a, in a doorway may find its way into one of my fashion photographs um, people I meet on the street may I might like the way that they're dressed and, and I'll instruct a stylist to, to try and give me something of that nature. But it's, it's difficult sometimes because if they aren't open to, to seeing the world in a different set of eyes, they tend to give you the same thing. So it's, right. it's finding members of your team is, is very vital because they've got to feel yeah. not necessarily see they have to feel right, the things right. that you feel right yeah absolutely that shows through your work the sort of experiences that you have um, and it affects people in a, in, a, in a dramatic way I would say it, it affected me especially when I first discovered you and your work I, 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 ha I was compelled to reach out to you <laughs> Compelled, literally. It must have been slow news week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you influenced me. You influenced me. Your work and and through your work, I've learned. And then just working with you, I've learned that you and I have a similar upbringing. And that influenced me and made me want to work harder with my photography. Good. So I appreciate that. I do. And I'm glad that that I know that connection now is that your life is your work is a result of your life and now I'm working on my result <laughs> yeah, I, you know the, think of all the places that you've been to so far in your life all the places that you've lived all that goes into shaping you and yeah. shaping your vision yeah. and it's what separates you from from every other photographer it isn't simply taking a picture and then photoshopping it to death. Yeah. A photograph has to feel. It has to has to draw something of the viewer. It has to ask as many questions as the viewer as it answers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be just a person standing there and then it's all photoshopped. And, <laughs> and, I mean, what does that say? Yeah, it says you're good at computers. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and you have money to buy software. Yeah. And the thing about software is that, you know, it doesn't matter what plug-in or, or uh, uh, 
Photoshop filter that you buy. It works the same way for everybody. Yeah. You know, yes, of course, you can check, you know, one person may use an 80% opacity, another person may use a 41% opacity. But you know what? At the end of the day, it works the same for everybody. So what are you doing different? Yeah. You know, the... the you know, the, you hear arguments about old school, new school. I say bullshit. Yeah. There's only one school, and there's one. And that school, regardless of whether shooting digital or film, that school is knowing photography, it's kn- learning how to read light, how to make light create emotion, how to um, to see this the same thing in a different set of eyes each time to question yourself to push yourself to not be afraid to make mistakes because from making mistakes you learn Mm. and sometimes and oftentimes making that mistake is the right thing to do it it, um, you know when it was filmed you really experimented you had to Mm -hmm. you you had to continue to challenge yourself it wasn't shooting a five minute picture and then spending five years five hours in photoshop (laughs) you know I mean 12 frames you know don't don't get me wrong I'm not I've got nothing against computers or digital what I do have against is a bullshit picture and then all this Photoshop work trying to make a bullshit picture look like something and it's still bullshit at the end of the day. It's just Photoshop to bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So you, you spoke about making the mistakes. Uh, early on, I'm sure, you know, you had your journey of mistakes. Uh, what did you do before photography sort of... Uh, like early on, what was that transition for you? What did you do early on? Well, I used to be a creative director for uh, three of the uh, top leading hairdressing companies at that time in the uh, late 70s and 80s. And um, during that time, I began teaching myself photography. And uh, one day, a photographer that we had booked to shoot one of our campaigns um, ended up getting put in jail for DWI or something like that. Mm. So I shot the campaign and from there it just the bug <laughs> bit me in the ass and <laughs> yeah. I'd gotten as far in the uh, in the company as I could go until somebody died or retired. Yeah. And uh, that didn't seem real appealing to me uh, to wait around. So I I um, just left, retired from the beauty industry, and embarked on a on a new career. And I began teaching myself uh, because the technical aspect of photography you can learn from books. Style and feel, no one can teach you. That mm. comes from within. Mm. That's what separates one photographer from another. Yeah. And yes, when we were doing film, we experimented. We constantly. Did. Well. I was uh, uh, teaching myself how to develop and so forth. I had friends at A&I Color Lab in Los Angeles that were uh, helping me along uh, because that's where I started my career. And um, I had uh, shot some E6 transparency film. And I went to the uh, photo store to buy color developer. And I bought the wrong developer. I bought C41 developer mm. for color negative. Mm. Well, anyway, I developed it. And I, was, I came away with these really weird saturated colors. And I knew I screwed up. But it fascinated me. So I went to my friends at A&I. And, and they told me that, you know, I had bought the wrong developer. Fascinated me so much that I started buying all different films and started working with filters and stuff like this uh, and continued to develop it in the wrong developer. And what I didn't realize at that time was that I had entered the advent of what we call cross-processing. Yeah. And only a handful of photographers at that time were doing it that I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of, but photographers like Nick Knight, Javier Valenois, well, they were doing wonderful things with this. Well, 
so I started, I learned to control it. You can get natural looking skin tones in these wonderful, wonderful saturated colors that even today, uh, these companies that make Photoshop plugins, they can't right. completely emulate what right. cross processing does. But mm. anyway, I ended up uh, getting hired to shoot the. 1990 uh, Z Cavarici campaign, national campaign that ran in Vogue and Glamour and all that with my name running down the side of that ad. <laughs> nice. All in my cross-process look. <laughs> so, wow. And that all came from an accident. So that was your first big break? That was my first big break and uh, from there I started getting all sorts of uh, denim advertising campaigns and uh, things like that and uh, after a few years of that, um, I finally figured that I had, wasn't that I was any good, I was lucky. Mm. And that if I wanted to be where I really wanted to be in my career, that, uh, which was shooting for the, the big magazines, the big fashion magazines and clients, that I had to go where the heart of fashion was at that time, which was Paris. So I sold everything, packed up my two Canon A1 cameras and two lenses and moved to Paris where I screwed up again. <laughs> and I did that. I, I told, it was at one time that the French, it was the funk at the time. And it was the one time that the French franc was actually worth more than the U.S. dollar. Oh. And I totally miscalculated my monies. And I didn't have enough money to get an apartment. And I didn't want to tell the photographer that I was coming to assist that I didn't have a place to stay. So <laughs> I bought a sleeping bag and burled a hole in a hedge grove in uh, a big park in Paris. And I lived in a park for two uh, uh for two months, gave myself two centimes a day to, to bathe in the uh, park restroom and one franc a day for my meal, and it was the most exciting time of my life. I bet. I saw the city at night in ways that no tourist would ever see. Yeah. Because I was essentially homeless, so I... But to me, I wasn't homeless. Yeah, yeah. I was on an adventure, a wonderful, wonderful adventure. Wow, wow. So. It's funny that you mentioned that because when I look at the industry today, and you can give me your feedback on this, but it feels like a lot of people are siloed. And it, it, your, your early beginnings, it seemed like you worked with a lot of other great photographers who were also interested in being creative together. The, I don't think that people would be willing to leave their home, go to Paris, and and experience a different perspective like that. No, I mean, today they, they go from living a comfortable home to going to photo school, <laughs> still living at home, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're out with their portfolios made of lesson plans and they think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread <laughs> and um, uh, if people don't you know back when I was starting out but there was camaraderie around photographers yeah they, they shared things they got together and had meals there wasn't this backbiting and, and yeah. slagging the other person and, and uh, people let their work do the talking for them. Right. They didn't have the egos that I see today. Yeah, there's a lot of ego. A lot of ego. Uh, how did they earn them? I mean, one thing I've learned in this business is that the bigger they are, the nicer they are. Mm -hmm. And it's the ones at the bottom that have the biggest, humongous egos. And because there's a difference between confidence and ego. Yeah. And, and confidence comes from experience. It comes from longevity. It comes from, um, you know, magazines that I've worked with, British Cosmo, Harper's Bazaar, Marie Claire, Elle. Uh, you're working to a whole different standards than so many of these young people could even fathom. Yeah. And 
the other thing is, is that you're dealing with creative directors and, and fashion directors that aren't 20-somethings. They're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They're, you know, Grace Coddington at 73. What what could possibly, could some young photographer come around with that, that, that Grace hasn't seen? Yeah. She's worked with some of the best photographers in the world. I would say she was, has worked with all the best photographers in the world. So... Thing is, is that if I was a young photographer starting out today, I'd keep my mouth shut and just learn from these people. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you hear that? Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> just learn. That's that's the, that's that's the humbling road right there. That's that's one of the biggest things that I learned in Paris. I kept my mouth shut, my eyes open, and my ears constantly open to listening and so forth. I took notes and I would watch and I would my questions would be answered because I by watching what was happening, watching how the photographer directed the model, watching how the photographer worked with clients. Because it's not just the artistic aspect, it's this is a business of art and commerce. Yeah. If you don't know business you're gonna be a broke broke photographer. Yeah. Who, who was your mentor at that time? Uh, Jean-Baptiste Mondino. Yeah. You mentioned Mon- Mon- Mondino a lot when I was assisting for you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely. Um, it was like watching a musician uh, uh, just how he looked at things. Yeah. And... And he would just he would he would have the answer. Yeah. And you'd, and you'd turn around and look at and go, that's brilliant. <laughs> you know, it, it's something you have to experience. It's, it's difficult to put into words. Yeah. It, it's it's like watching a musician work on a composition and they place their hands on the keyboard and the music music notes just start flying yeah that comes from passion absolutely so since since then you've worked with a lot of great names a lot of great people uh, I've, having been assistant, assisting with you your team is amazing you, you keep great people around you but I want to know what what continues to inspire you I know you said sometimes you'll you'll walk down the street you'll see a couple or a woman with a dress or something on outside of that do you have any other influences well the when people look at my work for example on my website or, or the magazines I'm shooting to a lot of different demographics how I shoot for British Cosmo is going to be different than how I shoot for Harper's Bazaar because I'm dealing with different demographics you know the I would be bored to death if I shot my photographs all look in the same way in, in one look or one style right. you know if you really study my work and look at the models look at what I get out of the models there, I, there's my style, my viewpoint. How the pictures look are continually going to change as seasons change, as as fashion changes. You know, um, and the different demographics that I'm working with. British Cosmo, it's brighter, it's crisper, it's, it's cleaner. Um, Harper Bazaar, darker and moodier. Mm. Um, also, if I'm shooting during the spring summer, the photographs are going to be brighter and colorful. Look at the magazines. Uh, the, the editorial is brighter and colorful. In the fall, it gets darker and medium. The, um, and it, I think it's important that you create personal projects for yourself, whether it be shooting portraits of people on the street or... Um, you know, for myself, I like shooting florals, very stark florals. Um, I work with different depths of field, different lighting. Um, 
it's these are things that relax me that challenge me in different ways that shooting uh, and it, it's a nice break from shooting fashion uh, it's, and yet in a way it is fashion because we aren't just as photographers we aren't just shooting a fashion picture we're documenting and chronicling life at that moment in time yeah yeah at that period it, it, it's you know 10 years from now 20 years from now someone looking back at our pictures that that documents what life was happening at that period of time right right so yeah wow. um, I, I kind of rambled there I, no no I, I get it I get it definitely shoot shoot for the moment yeah I mean you can only shoot for yourself I mean when you're doing a job you're shooting for the client but right. at that same time at that same token you're um you're bringing as much art and as much of yourself as that client or magazine's demographics can handle. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Can you think of a time where that didn't work out for you or where you failed or let a client down? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we all have, have had that. I mean, um, you know, I mean, the same uh, same things that I've told my assistants that uh, apply to myself as well. I mean, anyone can shoot for a client one time, but to work with that client again and again and again, that's where it takes talent. And I've had an, I've had my share of clients that I've shot for one time. And for some reason or another, and unfortunately, you never find out why. But when you look back at your work, you can kind of figure out why. I mean, I remember this one, uh, I won't mention their name, but it was a uniform company that, um, quite frankly, watching paint dry was more exciting. <laughs> and uh, I failed miserably. And why? Because I wasn't interested. Yeah. I, I was doing it for the money. Mm. And money should never be the fact. I mean, we all want to get, we all want to be paid and so forth. But it shouldn't be the driving factor of our work. Right. Once the deal is made, the deal is made. Now you concentrate on the work. And unfortunately, the jobs that I've failed at have been the jobs that I've taken on just for the money. Yeah, I think I think we all, I think a lot of us new photographers, we look at the how much is it going to pay? You know, can I sustain myself? Mm -hmm. Especially I live out in New York City and you know you know how that market is so oh yeah the squirrels charge you a dollar just to look at them <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah and they and they fight back yeah and the rats are asking you for a cigarette <laughs> right and a slice of pizza yeah <laughs> so let's move into a little more of your technical work how what is your workflow like if you no, you don't have to give the, uh, the you know the juicy secrets or anything, but just give us an idea of what what your expectation is. I've I've worked with you on set, and it's amazing. But well, I do a lot of planning and preparation. I do a lot of research. If I'm photographing uh, a celebrity or uh, um, a person of interest for a magazine. I do. I really study my homework on them. Yeah. I research as much as I can. Um, if I'm doing a fashion story based on a period of time, I've fortunately lived through certain periods of time that I can draw from personal experiences from. Yeah. But I think too many young photographers today they don't do their homework mm. and know about their subject and and study different things about them that uh, can aid in, in creating the photographs uh, that's uh, and when I go into a shoot my lighting 
is based upon what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. I don't go in with a canned lighting setup where um, everything is lit the same way. Um, I look at, uh, I start, I start building the lights, and then I move lights a lot uh, because I light for how I want the photograph to look. Right. Um, and I work with 80% plan, that other 20% are those wonderful little things that that happen, the shape that you didn't plan on, yeah. that you look at and you go, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So. I remember the shoot we did with the ballet mm-hmm. um, at the Joffrey Ballet. Right. That shoot right there blew my mind because I couldn't see what you what you saw in your head and assisting and setting the lights. I, from that perspective, I was like, wow, this is going to look great. But when I saw the photos, photos I, it was amazing. <laughs> it wasn't just great. It was amazing. So... As you're, as you're, when you're on the set and you're thinking, and you, uh, how much of a tweak are you doing? Are you, are you hinting more for shadows, or are you hinting more for the lighting of the subject? Well, the Joffrey story, we were working with uh, ballet dancers. We were working with uh, child, um, child soldiers. Um, wanted to create was almost like a fairy tale Mm. and just doing broad even flat lighting Mm. you wouldn't have created that depth because those ballet dancers as they arched and so forth light and shadow flow together so well to bring out a story where a flat light just it's just flat it's boring I mean it's there's nothing to draw the viewer in and so I chose to utilize directional lighting. I chose to position lighting where I was shooting into the lighting and, and the dancers became silhouette. Uh, and then part of their bodies would meld into the light. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was fortunate that uh, the shoot came out very well received. Yeah. So shooting into the light that that blew my mind because as as you know as I'm watching the set being created in front of my eyes I'm thinking like you know won't this interfere won't this won't this but it didn't at all it just it just enhanced the photo sevenfold and added to sort of like a model itself. The light became a model itself. Well, the dancers were also moving. And so yeah. They're moving in and out of the light. Yeah. You're, you're drawing the viewer in. You're bringing them up. It's much like music. You have that that pulsating beginning, and then it slows, and then draws you back yeah. in. Yeah. And it's like listen, singing that chorus line in the car with your friends, <laughs> yeah. and, and you got all all these different octaves and. Yeah. and that's to me is how a photograph should flow. Absolutely, and that's creating a photo, not taking a picture. Absolutely. That that that. If you if you don't see the finished photograph in your head, you're never going to hit it. Yeah. Because then you're just stumbling around looking for something until you find something that you think looks good, and yeah. at the end of the day, it looks like shit. Yeah. That was the biggest lesson I got was the difference between taking a picture and creating creating a photo. You, you know, you're, you really draw the viewer in. Ask as many questions there of the viewer. And, yeah. You know, so. I still have those lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm going to keep those forever until they burn out. <laughs> you steal them from me? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, no. I, I did a couple of shoots in my living room with those lights. I love those lights. They're great. So, so when things slow down, and in, in this industry they typically do, how do you maintain? Oh, this industry, I mean, uh, you, you're dealing with... Uh, for, uh, you're dealing with different seasons, for example, like uh, December, January, always slow in the industry because uh, 
that's the time that uh, your international editors go on holiday and so forth. Um, and besides the seasonal changes, you have the career changes where one minute everybody knows who you are and wants you, the next minute nobody knows who you are and nobody wants you. Right. So that's where business comes in because you have to make sure that you put aside enough money to be able to pay your bills while you're uh, I don't call it reinventing yourself because that's coming out with a, a different point mm. it's shooting things to keep your mind fresh to keep your work fresh and use that time to look at the changes in the industry. Yeah. You may, um, there might have been budget cuts with the, with the publication. There might have been uh, staff changes or staff cuts. All these different things affect um, your position uh, as a photographer um, and, uh, and demand and so forth. And uh, uh, style changes within a magazine or a client. Uh, these can affect the demand. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you've also got the, uh, the thing where, you know, you always have people that are willing to work for next, for not, next to nothing, uh, thinking that that's going to give them a give them a break or a leg in but it's it's like I've always to, I've told uh, my assistants that you know if a client gets you for a nickel they're never going to pay you a dime right right yeah and you know the thing is they got you for a nickel this time next time they're going to say well you shot for a nickel last time why, <laughs> why are you charging me more yeah I've experienced that yeah so with that said what would you say is a quote that you live by oh wear a hat on a rainy day <laughs> wear a hat on a rainy day folks I don't know it, it's I've got a number of you know it's I, I think the one that stays with me the most because I don't let everybody in, in in my circle, but the ones that I do, that I see the most talent in, I push the hardest. Because if you aren't pushed, you become complacent. And I have a saying that, it's an old poem that I learned long ago when I was a child. And it goes, when this you see, remember me and bear me in your mind. Let all the world say what they may. Speak of me as you find. And what I try and mean by that is when you think that I'm being hard on you, I'm not. It's because I see greatness in you, and that's why I'm pushing you. Because if I didn't see greatness in you, I would, I'd just regulate you to folding stands and <laughs> right. not ever working with you again. Yeah. yeah. But I push the hardest the ones I believe in, and that means models, makeup artists, stylists, assistants. Because, like I said, you don't know truly how great you can be until you're pushed. Right. If no one's pushing you, you're going to do the same thing. Yeah. And sail through life. Uh, you're never going to... You're never going to push yourself. Yeah. Because you become complacent. Yeah. yeah. And if you become complacent, you become lazy and the world passes you by. Right. Yeah. Then, you're, uh, then you're at a point where the world's passed you by and now you got to play catch up. And the problem is you never catch up. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I've been fortunate that... I've had my work exhibited at the Louvre, and, and this was never work that I set out to, oh, I'm going to make an art photo. I've been fortunate that, that fashion photographs that I've made through my career have found their way into being considered art. Yeah. So. Yeah, your work has been featured 
on televisions, all every type of magazine you can think of. Oh, it was art. A, used as uh, uh, stage setting for, or set setting for yeah. uh, the TV show Ugly Betty. Yeah. So I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> yeah, and that was a huge show. Yeah, I have <laughs> pictures of Selma Hayek holding uh, the, the fake Mode magazine cover with my work on it. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. Wow. Do you ever meet her? Yes. Yes. Wow. Wonderful person. Wow. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, next time slide her my number, okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the industry now, because you grew up different industry. You had the great, the greats around you. Uh-huh. What would you say that you miss, hate, or love about the industry now? I wish, I don't want to use the word hate, because... So, I wish there was the passion again in the industry that was there in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s that I experienced. Yeah. Um, I wish there was the camaraderie where you could get, you know, five, six photographers could get together and have dinner and have great time and just talk about photography without being jealous of one another. Yeah. Um, I wish that there was where you could exchange technical things and and things like and bounce ideas off of each other without worrying that oh someone's going to steal my idea mm. come on at the end of the day everything has been literally done yeah you know, what, what, you're stealing everything what already yeah. what is different <laughs> is how we see those things yeah. I mean you, th- you think uh, 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 using flat lighting and, uh, against white seamless you just you discovered it come on <laughs> jeez <laughs> Yeah, uh, Leibovitz was shooting that way back in the day, Rolling Stone. Oh my God! I mean, uh, everybody tries to copy her lighting and yeah. so forth. But the thing is, is you know she's been doing that for so long. And the thing is, is that I think it's it. I think it's harder for young photographers today to make their mark than it was uh, in the eighties and nineties because, again, like I said, they're you had to know photography. You had to. You were constantly pushing yourself to create and so forth. And so, therefore, you could create a look that was yours, yeah. a, a style and so forth. Today, you know, everybody's shooting digital. They're putting it in the computer because mm-hmm. digital is designed to be com- working in the computer. Yeah. They're slapping the same Photoshop plugin and so forth, and they're patting themselves on the back, calling themselves creative. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the the, the thing that uh, uh, that I tell my sisters and I told and I told you is that before you can create the future, you have to know the past because it's the past coupled with the present that make up the future. It's in order to go forward, you have to know where you come from. Yeah, and um, so by. Um, you know, it, it's like, for example, if you were doing a, a 60s fashion story, it, it isn't going on to the internet and looking at pictures and so forth. You have to experience it because the 60s wasn't just flower power and hippies in California. In, in London, it was the mods and the rockers and mm. so forth. And think of the music influx, the British invasion, all of that. Yeah. That goes into shaping your pictures, creating that that period. It, it's your models have to become like actors. They have to uh, the body language, the expressions on the face, all of that. As a photographer, you have to direct. That's not something you then put in the computer and then just Photoshop it. it it's it's. I don't know. I, I just. It goes back to experience and you know, telling the story. I see a lot of things that, or a lot of pictures today that I just go, I, I don't feel a thing when I look at them. Yeah. They're just boring. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, it seems to be that 
young photographers, you know, are more interested in slapping a photo, uh, a photo on Facebook, and, and uh, they consider it a success if they get 25 or 30 likes. <laughs> Yeah, so so let me let me guess. You love social media. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I personally, I think it's uh, you know, it's fine if you want to stay in communication with people you know and so forth. Other than that, having five thousand so-called friends that you have never met in your life and you and 99.9 percent of them you don't even bother looking at their profile yeah i mean that's kind of a joke so yeah i i don't put any relevance into that yeah so i was recently um reading up about uh, older photographers, uh, specifically the London influence, mm-hmm. and how they were at that time rock stars of the industry. Oh, you must be <laughs> talking about Terrence Donovan, David Bailey. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, Brian Duffy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah they the were the rock stars. Three. Yeah, they definitely called the shots. Yeah, they they were uh, nicknamed the Terrible Three by the modeling agencies, not because uh, they were bad photographers. Uh, they were great photographers, but they were called the Terrible Three because they had a running bet between the three of them who could uh, get laid the most. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, there you have it, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> that was, that's how they got their nickname. <laughs> well, nowadays, it seems like the models are the rock stars. Yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, they, they were in the 80s and 90s when the, the term supermodel first got coined. You had right, Linda right. Evangelista, uh, uh, Christy Turlington, mm-hmm. uh, Naomi Campbell, all of them. These were the original superstar models. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate to have uh, helped uh, start, uh, start a number of the models that you see at the top. Carly Kloss, I booked Carly Kloss for her very first magazine cover and editorial. Uh, I uh, started helped start off Amanda Murphy, um, Ava Smith, um, and uh, uh, it, it's interesting when I worked with Carly. Uh, I in the middle of the shoot, I said, "I hope I'm not pushing you too hard." She goes, she looked me right in the eye, and she goes, "I want you to push me harder." And wow. at that moment, I knew I was looking at greatness. <laughs> and look where she is now. Yeah, yeah. And that was back in 2006. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So that's rare. Yes. Wow. I, I probably would have. Yeah, I probably would have. Yeah. I'm speechless after that. If I would have heard that on the set, I probably would. I probably be make myself available to the model anytime. <laughs> uh, I mean, too many times you get these models that if they have to do a jumping picture, they d- jump once, right, and then they go, "Oh, I got to do it again." Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, we right. do a jumping shot uh, 20, 30, 40 times yeah. because everything has to be right: the yeah. clothes, the hair, yeah. and so forth. And if you tell them, uh, you know, yeah, they have to jump again, they give this big sigh and look exactly. Oh, you're being so hard on me. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah. This is a business. It is. Yeah. It's why 5% of the models get booked for 95% of the work. That means 95% of the models are sitting on their ass. Yeah. So. Wow. Well. <laughs> I've been fortunate that, you know, it's not just me as a photographer. I've been fortunate that I've had great crews. I've had great assistants. I've had great makeup artists, great stylists. And... Great models like Carly. I mean, they just... They believe in you. They believe in themselves. And they want it. And they want to give you the very best. And you can't help but come out with something wonderful. Yeah. Those kind of people. I I will say, though, uh, because I reached out to you. I think you were traveling the world at the time. And you got back to me and and you said, all right, let's see. We'll see. Let's go for a trial. And uh, it was at the nightclub, that that first shoot, with uh, uh, Brianna Brianna and a couple other models. Oh, right, 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 right. And 
I was sweating bullets. I didn't know what to expect. And so many other assistants were, or trial assistants, were warning me. They was like, you know you gotta you gotta be on your shit, right? <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? Be on my shit. He's just a photographer. And I learned quickly that no, you got to put in work and get off your ass and do shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean the thing is is that you know that I don't have you know, I might have I have my assistants put the lights on the stands but I fit, I physically move my right, legs right. I don't you know tell you oh put these let's go ahead and set up the lights I do it because I I see the finished picture in my head you don't so the the thing is I'm I'm setting those lights to how I want the image to look how I want it to feel so it's not something that you can really, uh, you can really delegate to to someone and so forth. Um, you just hope that your assistants understand what it is that you're trying to get yeah. and try try those things for themselves. Yeah, I'm never afraid to show someone how I do something because no one's ever going to do it the same way as you. So what the hell are they doing? Yeah, you know. And at the end of the day, we all you know there isn't anything that we do that's so unique that. Uh, that someone else doesn't know it, but it's how we do things. That's yeah. what makes it unique. Yeah, and that's yeah. something no one can ever take from you. Yeah. So, you know, your own style, your own signature. Exactly, it's how you, you know, because you can see things differently than I do, and that's the wonderful thing about it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, think of how boring it'd be if we all looked at the world the same way. That's why I love photography. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. I really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. What's the best way for people to, to see you and your work? You mean besides the zoo? <laughs> uh, go to um, davidlesleyanthony.com. Um, that's my website and so forth. I'm also, um, in addition to my freelance career and um, I'm also a creative director for Art Design Magazine. Um, but uh, my website is probably the best, davidlesleyanthony.com. And uh, there, there's, you know, on the bio page, there's, uh, on the contact page, there's contact information and so forth. Anything you want to tell us young photographers to do or not do? Just believe in yourself. Yeah. Don't be afraid to make a mistake because there's no such thing as a mistake. There's only learning experiences because from the so-called mistakes are some of the greatest photographs. So, yeah. And the thing is, is that instead of asking yourself why, just say why not <laughs> and give it a try. Yeah. Well, what's the worst? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done shots that I, I've looked at it. I've looked at it and go, who the hell came up with this shit? <laughs> you know, and, and you move on. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I definitely toast to you, David. I'm glad to have met you and to be able to call you friend. Well, thank you, Errol. I uh, likewise, I, you know, because, uh, you know, all you guys have been part of my wonderful adventures. So. Yeah, it's been great. And I'm glad to be able to come down here to New Orleans and, and you know, break bread with you, have a drink with you. It's always the best. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And that's today's show. Thank you all for listening. And be on the lookout for the next episode, episode two with Andrea Samuels, makeup artist out of Chicago. Great makeup artist. She is great. She's worked with David as well. And, very nice uh, person. Also. Yeah. And she's opening up a studio. Or she opened it already in February, February 13th. So stay tuned. It's called Chicago Artist Studios. And also be sure to sign up on the website at theindustryview.com or send me questions on Twitter at, at the industry review online you'll get more information about the show this episode i'll put all the links to the photographers david mentioned and his link to his website and some photos that we've worked on together so stay tuned for that you'll also be able to find a little bit of a bio from uh from about david and more more artists as well have a great one and i'll see you next time thanks
Lari. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, I love your hair. Don't change the thing. <laughs> love to see all you do tonight. <laughs> Sands Radio Network.